Greetings, fellow gorehounds, and welcome back to a blood splattered vlog. I'm the horror guru, and I'm Count Jackula. And today we're gonna talk about Maxine. The Maxine, Maxine, you don't have to turn on the red light. Maxine. The latest feature film by writer-director Ty West and the latest entry in the X franchise. And the reason why I say the latest entry and not the final entry is because according to some interviews with Ty West, he's got some ideas for a fourth one. So we may see more X in the future. Go. Oh. And uh, if we do, I can't wait because this movie is phenomenal. <laughs> Yep. This movie is about uh, Maxine Minx, who survived the original X and has moved to Los Angeles and is trying to transition from her porn career into her movie star career. Yep. But unfortunately, dead bodies start piling up around her and someone has appeared from the shadows trying to blackmail her, all in an attempt to ruin her attempt at stardom. And uh, it's up to Maxine to figure out how to put a stop to these obstacles so that she can reach the stardom stardom that she so desperately craves. Like a good A24 film, this movie's got brutal violence, some legit slashing kills that are on the brutal side. Not quite Terrifier 2, but more brutal than your average slasher. Yeah. But it's also a movie about something. And that something is relentless ambition trying to succeed in a business that doesn't want you to succeed. It doesn't even need you. So you gotta make sure that it knows it does need you. And uh, I think the movie succeeds on all those fronts. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. It, it succeeds as a brutal slasher movie. And it also succeeds as a movie about the show business, the yes. picture business. Yeah, it's all about the picture business. And one of the great things about it is that every other scene in this movie is from an important horror movie. I can see that. I can totally see that. There's definitely like some direct illusions. Uh, yeah. There's a point in which she actually is on the Universal lot and encounters the Psycho House. Yeah. But there's also just scenes that are straight up like reminiscent of another movie. Yes. Yeah. Which is intentional because this is a movie about someone who wants to make movies and be a star. It makes it a fun movie to watch and rewatch because you can see a different detail each time and be like, oh shit, that's from Cruising, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, that's from Cruising. Like one of the movies that I couldn't believe that they referenced because mm -hmm. it's one of those, I knew Ty West knew horror movies, mm -hmm. but you don't usually bring out like Roger Corman's The Undead. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you don't usually reference that one. Absolutely. There's even a character in the movie who's kind of like, um, he's kind of like the character from Scream, Randy. Oh yeah. He's like the yeah. Randy of this movie where he's like making the horror movie references and he owns a movie store in the eighties. So a VHS store and sells both adult entertainment and horror which is exactly where this movie kind of like sits mm -hmm. in the realm of uh, cinema. Oh man, I miss those shops because there were a few of them. In the Bay Area, there were two of them. Mm -hmm. There was La Video. Nice. And then there was Leather Tongue. Leather Tongue Video was exactly the kind of shop that this guy owned. Oh yeah, porn's over there, cult cinema's everywhere else. <laughs> I also like that that character in particular, the Randy-esque character, was played by a black man. You don't normally yeah. see the horror fanatic being a person of color. No, I no, 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 awesome. no, it's super cool. Giancarlo <laughs> Exposito's in this movie. Who shows I... up as Maxine's uh, agent. Yep. And what I like about him is that you see a casting like that and you're like, oh man, he's being casted against type. And then as the movie goes on, you're like, oh no, actually, this is more his type than you realize yeah. when the movie began. <laughs> no one can like fucking give that cold ass stare. For those of you who don't know, he was the guy who played Gus on Breaking Bad. So you kind of have an idea of what we're talking about here when we talk about that stare. <laughs> yeah, and if you didn't see uh, that, he was uh, Moff Gideon. Yes, in, uh, in The Mandalorian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of those it guys to play villains. He's not a villain well, in this yeah. movie. He is not a villain in this movie, but he is playing a surprisingly intimidating dating character in this. The Puritan gave me the witch vibes whenever they would show scenes from it. Yeah. Which is a movie that's referenced in this movie because she gets cast in the sequel to The Puritan as her opportunity to become a star. And I love when that happens because like when she's talking to her friend and she's like, do you know how many stars got their start in horror movies? And then like a couple scenes later, Kevin Bacon shows up. Yes. <laughs> I thought yes. that was like, oh, that I, was amazing. I see what you did there, movie. <laughs> It's really good. It's a very sleazy movie. If you like oh, movies yeah. set in the 70s, or not in the this 70s, the 80s. set the in the 84. 80s. If you like movies set in the 80s with an 80s soundtrack and just 
utter sleaze. If we're not on a film set, we're on a porn set, or we're in a porn theater, or we're in a porn video store. Yeah, or we're on a recreation of fucking Sunset Boulevard in yep. the fucking 80s. Yep, you know. yep, yep, 100%. Or we're in the psycho house, because there's a point in which she goes into the psycho house, which was a really cool scene. Yes. <laughs> and there is another face in this movie mm -hmm. that may be familiar to you horror hounds out there. The Larry Fazenden makes, yeah. makes a cameo. He's got a great cameo in this movie. You'll know it when you see it, because if you know Larry Fassenden, he is a face you've seen in many a movie. Yeah. Uh, because he's one of those guys who not only produces a bunch of independent horror movies, he also stars in them. Yes. Uh, you may have seen him recently in Brooklyn 45. He was also in Jacob's Wife was a big one yes. from the last few years. One thing I really appreciate about this movie is while Maxine is not entirely a piece of shit, I like that the movie allows her to be bad. Oh, yeah. She cares about her friends, right? She actually does, but she's also ruthless. Yeah, very violent and very <laughs> ruthless. And I like that. She's a very complex character that's not the kind of cookie cutter character you normally see in a movie. Yeah, yeah. The best introduction to the way Maxine is in this movie is when the director is explaining the character that she's supposed <laughs> to be playing, which is she's a killer, but not a villain. <laughs> yes, exactly. Very much makes it clear how much had she had different outcomes earlier in life, she probably would have been Pearl. Yes. In X at some yes. point in her life. Yes. Had she not succeeded in ways that Pearl wasn't able to. Yeah. Unlike Pearl, she was able to escape home, become somewhat of a semi-star in the porn industry. Whereas Pearl couldn't even do that. So that's why Pearl- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pearl needed to get out of where yes. she was and she couldn't do that. No, she ended up settling at home and staying with her husband, which is why she turned into a murderous, murderous woman. Not later in life. She did that earlier in yeah. life and then stayed that way. <laughs> it just kind of seeped in it for the rest of her life. Yeah. Whereas uh, Max Maxine has all those same tendencies in her and she could have gone that route, but because she at least succeeded as a porn star, she had a leg up. Both yeah. literally and metaphorically, she had a leg up. Yes. Well, it's also it's also interesting because you don't normally have your hero be a sociopath. Yeah. Yeah. She's, but she's not 100% a psychopath. No. But because she does actually care about people. She does form connections to certain people and actually does care about them. There's a character in this movie that she does care about who dies. And you get to see her go through the grieving process of that. Yeah. Which is something you didn't get to see as much in X because everything was happening so that fast. That happens way too quickly. Yeah. Whereas the things that happen in this movie happen over the course of like a month. So there's some time for her to gestate on things that happen. She is awesome. And I really do hope that they... Uh, uh, make a fourth one and we get to see her again. Maybe we get to see what life is like when she actually is in the stardom and trying yeah. to maintain that stardom. That would be an interesting movie. Yeah, yeah. You they know? could do, man, they could do a lot of shit. Oh, absolutely. Know? Absolutely. I really dig the brutal gore effects in this. Oh, yes. Like, this movie does not shy away. It treats gore scenes the way a porn movie treats porn scenes. Yes. You're always going to yeah. get your money shot. And that money shot is going to be glorious and in your face. Yeah. Yes. There's one scene in particular that is one of the most brutal things that I've seen a main character in a movie do that you actually see on screen. <laughs> yeah. The other thing about this movie is it's very stylish. Ty West, you can tell he meticulously planned every shot so they transition into the next shot in a way yeah. that is very organic and natural and makes it so that while the editing is very stylish, it's kind of seamless. Like you, you might not notice the editing while it's happening, but it's really well done. Uh, yeah. The coloring, the neon coloring. Yeah, stuff, yeah. It the has the, the look of like 80s film grain. And what I like yeah. about it is the movie draws the connection between the neon lighting of like a horror movie and the neon lighting of like Hollywood, of yeah. of, of, of of the picture business. Yes. You know, bright lights, big cities. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lights, camera, action. Ah! Exactly. You know? And it does a good job of that. I have heard some people take issue with the final act of this movie, but I actually really liked the final act of this movie. I don't know how else they were going to end it. The only complaint I even have about the final act of this movie is I just wanted like five more minutes of it. I could see that. Which is not really a complaint because it's not like it's missing anything. I just didn't want the movie to 
end so soon, if that makes sense. <laughs> but we'll talk more about that in the spoiler section because throughout this movie, there's a mystery as to who the killer that's killing people around her is. Very real possibility throughout it that it could be the, the actual Night Stalker because yeah. it's referenced throughout the movie that the Night Stalker is killing people in Los Angeles. But it could also be someone using the Night Stalker's kills to disguise their own. Yeah. And when we get to the spoiler section, we will explain which it is. Yeah. There's actually a while where you're wondering if it's not Maxine herself. Oh, yeah. It could have worked because while I was watching the movie, I was realizing if that is the direction it went. And we'll talk in the, in the spoiler yeah, section yeah, yeah. whether it did. It would make sense in a fucked up way. Yeah. And that fucked up way is, oh, I see. She's killing everyone that might potentially be in the way of her achieving success. Yeah. In one way or another. Even someone she truly cares about might be in the way because truly caring about someone is a weakness. Yeah. And as she learns throughout the movie through encountering a very successful director who just rocked the world with essentially like her exorcist, given her multiple pep talks about what it takes to make it in the business, not just make it as in the business as a filmmaker and an artist, but as a woman in the business yeah. and how Maxine has a double uphill battle because she's not just a woman in the picture business in the 1980s. She is also an ex porn star. Actually, she's a current porn, she's star. A current porn star. She's filming yeah. porn while filming the other movie. So that makes her battle even more uphill. And that director gives her these very blunt pep talks. You can never miss a day. You have to always be here and you have to always bring your A game. You must let no motherfucker stand in the way of your path to success. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we will talk more about where that leads her in the spoiler in the section. Spoiler section. Yeah. I also want to say before we get to the spoiler section that this has officially dethroned Destroy All Neighbors, which has been sitting at the top of my movies of the year oh, list so far. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's been sitting there since fucking January and Maxine's come along and officially dethroned Throned it. Destroy All Neighbors is now number two, and Maxine is now number one, where she belongs, because she's a goddamn star. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my fellow gorehounds, Maxine is currently available in theaters. If you want to see it, you're going to have to go pay for a ticket and go see it in theaters. I'm sure it'll eventually hit streaming and home video at some point, but this movie was made to be seen on the big screen, so trust me, it's worth it on the big screen. And with that said, my fellow gorehounds, let us move on to the spoiler section. This Buster Keaton impersonator tries to like knife her in an alley and yeah. it does not go the way he thinks. No, not, I love that moment when she just like drop it Buster and I'm like, yeah. God damn it. Because he looks like Buster Keaton, <laughs> yeah. you know? When Buster Keaton dude mm -hmm. tries to stab her with his six inch switchblade, Drop it, Buster. Drop it, Buster. She pulls out a gun on him, makes him get on his knees, suck off the gun, but it doesn't end there. She doesn't just pull the trigger when uh, he completes his blowjob. Yeah. She makes him get on the ground and stomps on his nuts. And I don't mean he gets on the ground and then you see her stomp on his nuts off screen. I mean, it is a money shot full on onto full his on. nuts being squished in a beautiful effect. <laughs> just splat everywhere. Yeah. And I, Breaking here, some eggs. Here is one of the most amazing things about this kill and this scene. Actually, I don't know if she full on kills him, but she definitely fucking castrates him in this scene. Uh, yeah, his dick don't work. His no dick more. don't work no more if he survives this. If this is the first kill in the movie, flat out, then the first kill in this movie was done by Maxine, not the slasher killer. Yes. <laughs> At least the first kill on screen. There are bodies that are piling up behind the scenes, but we didn't get to see oh, that yeah, but yet. we don't watch that happen. Yeah. There is a point in which two characters she knows gets killed off screen, but then she receives a tape in which we get to see that happen. Yeah. But it's one of those you see it later after the bodies have already shown up. It's also there to like kind of set up you know, she could be the killer. Yes, she you know? could be. You don't it's, know what's going to happen now. It's very much a possibility that she could be the killer. One of the things that starts happening is, first off, like some of her co-workers in the porn business start getting killed in a style that's very reminiscent of the Night Stalker. Then she starts receiving like blackmail in the mail. Hey, I know you. I know that you were in the Texas Porn Star Massacre, which is how the movie refers to the events of X. I could leak this to the press and uh, this could put a wrinkle in your whole like climb to stardom. Right, that you killed an old woman. Yeah, you know? yeah. it was in self-defense, but it would still complicate your life if this got out and you had to like deal with the media circus of that. Now, I would argue that that might make her a bigger star if it turned out she had survived like a porn star massacre. Yeah. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> 
So she starts getting shit in the mail from this. It turns out the person sending it to her in the mail is a private detective who's been hired by a mysterious black gloved figure, a Jallo killer, yeah. essentially. Yeah. A Jallo killer has hired this private detective to shake down Maxine. And the private detective is played by Kevin Bacon, who is putting his sleaze levels to 11 the entire movie. Dude, he's just on fire the oh whole time. Oh my God. I never thought I would say this, but like, I think Maxine might have one of Kevin Bacon's best performances. It, yeah. Because there's a point where I realized I forgot he was Kevin Bacon and I just saw the sleaze ball that he was playing. Yeah. I don't even recognize Kevin Bacon anymore. Who is this man? <laughs> That's right, Maxine. Crush him with the car. <laughs> Which has to be my favorite kill in this entire oh movie. Oh my God. Maxine gets an ultimatum by the director of the movie she's been hired for that uh, she needs to put to bed whatever this thing is that's distracting her from doing her job on the film set. She needs to finish it, whatever it is, by any means necessary. So she takes this in her own psychopathic or sociopathic way that, okay, well, I got to kill the guy who's been blackmailing me. <laughs> so she gets her agent who turns out lived another life when he was an agent, and in that other life, he uh, did some pretty brutal things. Wait, is this just Gus if he was, if his cover yeah, was he was an yeah, agent? Yeah, exactly. So he and Maxine trap Kevin Bacon, knock him out, and then they put him inside a car with his hands handcuffed in the car so he can't get out of the car, and uh, put him in one of those car crusher things that they do at, like, junkyards yeah. to, like, compress the cars, and uh, just watch him as he just gets crushed. It's like one of those like TikTok videos that are like so satisfying of watching things get pressed. Oh yeah. But what I love is that they have this one really long shot where you see Kevin Bacon in the car yelling and screaming and I don't know when they swapped him out but the car literally gets yeah, crushed yeah, yeah. and the blood oozes out of it like a crushed fucking orange yeah. in a juicer. Yeah, there's a lot <laughs> of like, I like to describe them as melon full of stage blood shots. Yeah. <laughs> where there's not that much blood in each yeah body it doesn't matter shut the fuck up well, what i like about it is there's a lot of kills in this movie um that kind of come down to people dying to some sort of pressure being applied which yeah. is an interesting metaphor for the pressure that maxine is yeah under. they fucking juice kevin bacon yeah. like he was in a cold press <laughs> juicer <man>. yeah <laughs> And what I love about that shot is I'm watching it and I'm amazed because in the moment, I can't figure out how they pulled it off. It clearly had to be a stage magician yeah. trick. Afterwards, I thought of many ways they probably could have done that. Like they could have put like a little like Like a false bottom. Yeah, yeah. That allows him to go keep going underneath while the thing <laughs> it crushes on him. Uh, they could have done it digitally and just hid the seams. Yeah. Like, there are many ways they could have accomplished it. But in the moment when I was watching the movie in theater, I was like, I have no idea how they did that. So anyway, Maxine kills the dude that's blackmailing her, but there's still the question of who hired him and what's their whole deal? What's going on? Yeah, why her? Why her? So at the beginning of this movie, the movie opens up with a home video of young Maxine as a little girl back when she was trapped inside a Christian household with yeah. an over overbearing Christian pastor dad. In the home video, the dad is directing her to do a dance and is telling her to say like a very specific line. I will not settle for a life I do not deserve. Exactly, exactly. We open up with that movie and there's a question throughout the movie of was that just establishing her ambition or is there more to that scene that's going to be important later on? Yeah. By the end of the movie, it turns out to be vitally important because it turns out the killer, the person who has been killing the people around her and has been blackmailing her the entire time turns out to be her dad who has returned and tracked her down and wants to essentially exercise the the evil out of her because he's yeah. a Christian pastor, remember? And she's turned her back on the church and become a, a whore of Babylon, a whore a of porn Babylon, star. a whore of Babylon, a porn star. She must be exercised of these demons. Some of these demons include the people around her, yep. her fellow porn stars, her friend who watches horror movies with her. And of course, people involved in movies she's in that are about her dealing with the devil. Because again, she's, she's in uh, the Puritan do. Yeah. And here's the other thing about the twist at the end of this movie. The dad isn't alone. He essentially has a cult and it's a cult of angry parents who are angry that Satanism has infected the world. The world and is affecting the youth through 
evil devil lyrics in movies. In movies and music. Essentially, it's an evil PMRC at the end of this yes. movie. A cult of PMRC. They even have a clip of Tipper Gore in the beginning of the movie. Yeah, which is when you realize that another theme reoccurring throughout this movie is uh, people's backlash to horror films and porn films. Yes. Because looming over this entire movie is these protesters who keep showing up to protest the movie that she's starring in. So the fact that the dad at the end of the movie turns out to be the killer actually does bring all these themes in the forefront. Yeah. Now here's the thing, and here's where I think the movie loses a lot of people. When the dad shows up, it immediately turns into an over-the-top B movie. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Where the dad is hamming it up like something crazy, playing his best Christian Anton LaVey. <laughs> oh, you magnificent bastard. <laughs> You magnificent bastard. It's kind of brilliant. Yo, kind of brilliant. super brilliant. And here's the thing. The reason why the movie focuses so much of the background on the Night Stalker is not just to set the movie during a specific time period. Los Angeles in the 1980s, the Night Stalker is on the loose. It's also to reinforce the theme of the satanic panic. Yeah. Because the thing about the Night Stalker is unlike a lot of serial killers, he was very open about the Satanism thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He wanted to be seen as the devil. Exactly. And that also provides cover for her dad, who is using uh, the Night Stalker to cover up all of his kills. Yeah. While also cleansing all these vile whores. Yeah. And like, how to put it, you're like, well, yeah, that's how Christianity does it, right? You but know? I love at the end of the movie, he kind of turns into one of those charlatan televangelists where he's like, all right, honey, just play along with me. Because he's like, yeah. he's putting on a show. He's making his own movie. He's trying to counter the satanic influences of the media with his own media. Yeah. Yep. Oh man, it's great. Now, one thing that's very interesting about the end of this movie is that for most of the third act, Maxine is more of an observer than an active participant in what happens. Yeah. She gets captured by her dad and then the cops show up and then it basically becomes Waco between the dad's cult and the cops. And she's kind of like trying to survive this while also trying to get to her dad so she can like enact her revenge on the father. That's kind of the source of all her problems really. Yeah. Growing up in that very restrictive Christian household obviously did a lot of damage to her. And if you remember, there is that really brief scene in uh, X mm -hmm. where they pass that billboard. Oh, yeah. And you're, you know, like, you're like, oh, yeah. that was her dad. That's yeah. her dad's billboard. Her dad the whole time. Yep. Whoa. <laughs> I loved it. I fucking adored it. My only thing is I wished uh, Maxine did some more in this final act, but here's the thing. The scene where she's got the dad and the dad's already been shot by the cops so he's on the ground bleeding to death and she's got that shotgun right in his face. Yeah. And then she just straight up like has delusions of grandeur. Like literally. She starts to hallucinate or imagine what would happen after this. How she could capitalize on being the survivor of her dad's massacre and use that to springboard into success all because her dad was trying to stop her. And has that great moment where she just says you finally gave me what I've needed this whole time. Divine intervention. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> what a great fucking scene. Like she looks up, it's the light of the helicopter, yeah. like, the, like the light of heaven. Yeah. You know, yeah. Coming down. It's like, yes. So well done. It's so on the nose at times, but like in the best way possible. Oh yeah, well, I mean, you know, like an 80s movie. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> All three of these movies do a great job of bridging the gap between the grindhouse and the fucking art house. Oh yeah. Oh, Ty yeah. West is a master at it, and, he, and this, this movie is no this different. This is his best movie. Oh yeah. This is clearly it's his so best movie. so fucking good. And here's the thing, I said that after watching Pearl, and now I'm saying that again. Yeah. Like he's just one-upping himself. X was him getting back up to form. Yeah. Pearl, he knocked that one out of the mm -hmm. park. They knocked this. They knocked this one out of the park. Well, one thing, the thing that makes Pearl and Maxine a little bit better than X is, as much as I like X, it's so tied to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It almost feels like the movie's constantly reminding you of this classic movie that it wants to be compared to. Yeah. Whereas these other two movies, while they do make references to other movies throughout it, like Pearl references Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz a yeah. lot, they are so different from those movies, and they are yeah. so their own thing, and they reference multiple movies throughout that they kind of stand on their own a little better. Yeah. Even though they're both enhanced by X existing. 
Yes. This movie also ends on another iconic final shot, but I'm not gonna spoil that for you. If you haven't seen the movie yet, you'll have to experience that part for yourself. Oh my God, we're gonna make this reference? Yeah. We're gonna make this reference. <laughs> okay. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Damn, like, we got, oh, we're all right, baby, we're, uh, no. Let's do it. No idea is too stupid, you nope. know, holy crap. Nope, not at all, <laughs> not at all. It's a perfect trilogy. And with that said, my fellow Gorehounds, where can they find you, Count Chacula? Oh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you can find me on YouTube at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where I stream. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, I chill out over on Twitch. Anyway, what about you? Y'all know me, I'm the Horror Guru. You can find me at the Horror Guru on Twitch, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Just look up the Horror Guru or Blood Splattered Cinema, and I'll be there. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell so you're notified of my videos immediately upon their upload. And if you'd like to help out either of us more directly, be sure to check out our Patreon pages. And remember, if you decide to go the Patreon route, even a dollar a month can go a long way. And we could certainly use more Patreon donations. Yes. So please, if you haven't checked it out yet, please do, because our rent's been increased recently and we're gonna need to find more money somehow. We might have to end up like Maxine, turning tricks on the streets, which, you know, if you gotta do, you gotta do what you gotta do, you know? You gotta do, I mean, I'm, I'm told I got sweet ass, so <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I'm actually pretty confident. There you go. So if you don't want to see us turning tricks on the streets, I think this is going to backfire. They're all going to, <laughs> going to want to see us do it. If you don't want to see us turning tricks on the streets, then please check out our Patreons. And remember, even a dollar a month can go a long way. And with that said, my fellow Gorehounds, if you made it this far into the vlog, then I want you to comment below and be sure to comment below using the hashtag Fresh Squeezed Kevin Bacon. Use the hashtag Fresh Squeezed Kevin Bacon. That way I know. That way Jack knows. That way the whole world knows that you are going to be a guy. Goddamn star. <laughs>